Chapter 17 of With Cortez in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 17 The Insurrection. Cocama's prognostication was speedily verified for in the course of the next two or three days all the nobles who had joined him in preparations for a rising were by montezuma's orders arrested and sent in in chains and were placed with him in prison bathalda came on the day after roger's return with the news that the two ladies had reached cuitcatl's house in safety and as they believed without exciting observation the queen was anxious to know if he had seen Cocama, and whether her husband had any instructions for her. Amencha simply sent him some flowers, gathered by her own hand. Roger gave Bathalda Cocama's message to the queen. While out in the market, he purchased a large packet of choice and delicate sweetmeats, of which he knew Amencha was particularly fond, and gave them to Bathalda with the message that he would some day teach her to read and write, and then, when they were away from each other, they could talk at a distance. For some little time things went on quietly, but the Spanish greed and bigotry gradually worked the Mexicans up to a point of fury. At the suggestion of Cortez, Montezuma sent collectors to all the principal cities and provinces, accompanied by Spaniards, and these brought back immense quantities of gold and silver plate and other valuables, and to these Montezuma added an enormous treasure that had been accumulated and hidden by his father, amounting to a sum which astounded even the Spaniards. The value of the gold alone was equal to nearly a million and a half pounds sterling in the present day, besides a vast amount of gold ornaments and jewelry, and featherwork of excellent manufacture. A fifth of this was set aside for the king of Spain, the rest divided among the officers and soldiers. Even the extortion of this vast sum from the people might have been passed over in quiet, had the Spaniards been content to abstain from interference with their religion. But during the weeks that had elapsed since Montezuma had been a prisoner in their hands, they had vainly endeavored to convert the emperor and the nobles and attendants on him to christianity they had listened attentively to the preaching and exhortations of father almedo but their faith in their own gods was unshaken the bloody sacrifices were carried on as usual in the temples and these horrible spectacles naturally excited the wrath and indignation of the spaniards to the utmost although they themselves had in cuba and the islands put to death great numbers of the natives in pursuance of their own religious views cortez with many of his leaders went to the emperor and told him they would no longer consent to have the services of their religion conducted in the palace but wished to celebrate them publicly and therefore requested that the great temple should be handed over to them for their services. Montezuma was much agitated. He was a devout believer in his gods, and his conduct toward the Spaniards had been, in no slight degree, influenced by the belief that their coming had been foretold by Quetzalcoatl, and that they were the descendants of that god. However, after a conference with the priests, he consented that they should occupy one of the sanctuaries on the summit of the temple. Great joy was caused among the Spaniards at this permission. They at once took possession of the sanctuary and thoroughly cleansed it. They then decorated its walls with flowers and raised an altar, surmounted by a crucifix and an image of the Virgin. When all was ready, the whole army moved up the winding ascent to the summit, and a solemn mass was celebrated. The result of this occupation of the temple of their god was soon visible in the conduct of the Mexicans. 
montezuma himself became grave and distant towards the spaniards and a few days later sent for cortez and informed them that they were in great danger and that they had best leave the country at once cortez replied that he should regret to leave the capital so suddenly when he had no ship to take him from the country but that if he should be driven to take such a step he should feel compelled to carry the emperor along with him montezuma then agreed to send at once a number of workmen to the coast to build vessels under the instructions of the spaniards and promised to use his authority to restrain his people assuring them that the spaniards would leave as soon as means were provided a large number of artisans were accordingly sent off at once with some of the spaniards most skilled in shipbuilding and on their arrival at the coast they began to fell trees and to make all preparations for building the vessels in the meantime at mexico every precaution was taken by the spaniards since montezuma had been in their hands they had felt in perfect security had wandered about the city and neighboring country as they chose fished upon the lake and hunted in the royal preserves now the utmost vigilance was observed strong guards were mounted the soldiers slept in their armor with their arms beside them and were no longer permitted to leave the palace at this moment news arrived that filled the mind even of cortez with consternation the expedition that he felt sure velasquez the governor of cuba would dispatch against him had arrived on the coast and had landed it consisted of eighteen vessels carrying nine hundred men of whom eighty were cavalry so large a fleet had never before been collected in the indies it was commanded by a castilian noble named panfilo de narvaez until they arrived at the coast they had learned very little of what was happening in mexico as the vessels which cortez had dispatched had avoided touching at the islands they now learned from the spaniards left on the coast all that had taken place and narvaez found with indignation that cortez was the conqueror of a great empire and that the honor and wealth had been reaped by a man whom he considered as an insolent adventurer instead of by velasquez he therefore at once proclaimed his intention to march against cortez and to punish him for his rebellion and the natives who had flocked to his camp soon comprehended that the new army had arrived as enemies and not as friends of the white men who had preceded them a small body of the troops of cortez commanded by sandoval were in garrison at villa rica and he at once dispatched a messenger with the news to cortez and prepared for a vigorous defense a priest a noble and four spaniards who arrived from narvaez ordering him to surrender were bound placed on the backs of indian porters and sent off to mexico under a strong guard when the news of the arrival of the force of narvaez reached mexico the soldiers were delighted believing that means were now at their disposal for their return home but when they heard from their officers that the newcomers were sent by the governor of cuba and had assuredly arrived as enemies the troops declared that come what might they would remain true to their leader on the arrival of the prisoners cortez received them with the greatest courtesy apologized for the rough conduct of sandoval and loading them with presents converted them into allies he learned from the priest that the soldiers of narvaez had no hostility towards them and that the arrogance of their leader caused much discontent among them when he was sure of the good offices of the priest cortez sent him back with a friendly letter to narvaez whom he adjured to lay aside his hostile designs which if persisted in might cause the loss of all the conquests he had made he was ready he said to greet him as a brother and to share with him the fruits of his successes the priest fulfilled his mission and added his own advice that the offers of cortez should be accepted narvaez rejected the council with scorn but the accounts of the priest of the splendor of the country 
the rich spoils won by the soldiers and also of the generosity and popularity of cortez exercised a great influence over the soldiers the priest was followed by father almedo with some more letters these were similarly rejected by narvaez but almedo during his stay at the camp contrived largely to add to the feeling in favor of cortez by his eloquence and the numerous presents he distributed among the officers and soldiers cortez had some time before dispatched don velasquez de leon one of his trusted officers with a hundred and fifty men to plant a colony near the mouth of one of the great rivers he was a kinsman of the governor of cuba and narvaez had on landing sent to him begging him to quit the service of cortez and march with his troops to join him velasquez instead of doing so set out at once for mexico but on his way was met by a messenger from cortez who ordered him to stop at cholula for further orders cortez summoned a force of two thousand natives from the distant province of chinantla and leaving pedro de alvarado in command of a hundred and fifty spaniards in mexico marched with the remainder of his force consisting of some seventy men only for cholula here he was joined by velasquez with his hundred and fifty men thus reinforced they marched to tlascala where six hundred native troops joined him but his allies soon fell off they had had too severe an experience of the fighting powers of the white men to care about taking part in a battle with them and so many deserted on the way that cortez dismissed the rest saying that he would rather part with them then than in the hour of trial on reaching perote they were joined by sandoval with fifty spaniards which brought their number up to two hundred and sixty-six only five of whom were mounted on their march towards Campoala, where narvaez had now established his headquarters they were met by an embassy from him requiring the acknowledgment by cortez of his authority offering at the same time that all who wished to leave should be transported in his vessels by liberal presents cortez won over the members of the embassy who returned to Campoala to inform the soldiers there of the liberality of cortez and of the wonderful array of gold ornaments and chains worn by his soldiers narvaez advanced to meet cortez but the weather proving bad again fell back on Campoala. cortez on the other hand took advantage of the weather and in the night fell upon the garrison and took them completely by surprise sandoval with a small band had been told off to attack the temple occupied by narvaez and to take him prisoner the general with the troops in the temple defended himself bravely until seriously wounded by one of the long spears with which cortez had armed his men the thatched roof of the temple was set on fire the defenders were driven out by the smoke and narvaez was seized and made prisoner another division under olid fell upon the guns captured them and turned them upon the temples in which the troops were quartered when the soldiers whose loyalty to their commander had already been sapped accepted the offer of cortez of an amnesty for the past and a full participation in the advantages of the conquest of the country having sworn allegiance to cortez as captain-general they were incorporated in his little army in the morning when they saw how small had been the body of men who had defeated them many regretted the course they had taken but in the course of the day the two thousand native allies from chinantla arrived and their military appearance and the proof afforded by their presence of the influence of cortez with the inhabitants of the country put a stop to the murmuring especially as cortez ordered all the spoils taken from them to be returned and distributed among them considerable sums of money exciting indeed murmurs of discontent among his own veterans who considered that they had been deprived of the spoil they had rightfully won the eloquence of their general however as usual was successful in pacifying them but to prevent further difficulties he broke up his force 
and sent off two hundred men under diego de ordaz and a similar number under velasquez de leon to form settlements on the coasts and rivers and two hundred men to vera cruz to dismantle the fleet of narvaez scarcely had these parties left when a messenger arrived with letters from alvarado saying that the mexicans had risen and assaulted the spaniards in their quarters and had partly undermined the walls and that in the fighting several of the garrison had been killed and a great number wounded cortez at once dispatched messengers after velasquez and ordaz and ordered them to march to join him at tlascala recalled a hundred men from vera cruz and then set forward the troops suffered much in their march across the low country to the foot of the hills beneath a sun of terrible power however they reached tlascala and were there joined by ordaz and velasquez they were most hospitably entertained by their allies and a number of levies joined them and with these and eleven hundred spaniards of whom a hundred were cavalry they marched towards mexico they took a more northern route than before and crossing the mountains held their way on to tezcuco upon their route through the plains the peasantry held aloof and the greater portion of the population of tezcuco withdrew before their arrival and even its new lord although appointed at the instigation of cortez was absent from the city dispatches arrived from alvarado saying that the mexicans had for the last fortnight ceased their attacks but were blockading them in the palace cortez marched down the lake shore on the following day and crossed the causeway to the city not a native was to be seen near the line of march not a boat was visible on the lake and an air of gloom and solitude hung over everything showing but too plainly the altered feelings with which the natives regarded the whites the streets were similarly deserted when the head of the column reached the palace the gates were thrown open and the garrison rushed out to greet the newcomers with joyful shouts cortez now learned the reason of the rising of the mexicans it was the result of a hideous act of treachery on the part of alvarado in the month of may was the great festival of the war god which was held in his great temple and the caziques asked permission of alvarado to use for the day the portion which had been handed over to the spaniards he agreed to the request on the condition that the aztecs should celebrate no human sacrifices and should come unarmed at least six hundred nobles attended in their most gorgeous robes and alvarado and his soldiers were present as spectators while the aztecs were employed in a religious dance alvarado gave the signal his men rushed upon them with their arms and every one of them was massacred unresistingly not a single soul escaping various motives were assigned for this most foul massacre some writers have ascribed it solely to the desire for plunder others to the desire of alvarado to strike a blow that would intimidate the mexicans from making any insurrectionary movement alvarado himself declared that he had information that the mexicans intended to rise but he gave no proofs whatever to justify his suspicions the affair indeed seems to have been utterly indefensible and must ever remain a foul blot upon spanish honor cortez was extremely angry at hearing what had taken place and after listening to alvarado's explanation said you have done badly you have been false to your trust your conduct has been that of a madman it was however no time for quarrels and as it was the impolicy of the deed rather than its treachery that angered cortez he speedily forgave the offender who was one of the most popular officers in his army the blow alvarado had struck had a contrary effect to that which he had expected of it no sooner had the news of the massacre spread through the city than the whole population rose and at dawn next morning they attacked the palace with desperate fury volumes of missiles were poured upon the defenders the walls were assaulted and the works set on fire and the palace might have been taken had not montezuma 
yielding to the entreaties and perhaps threats of the garrison, mounted the walls and urged the people to desist from the attack, as his own safety would be imperiled did they continue it. They obeyed him as usual and withdrew from the assault, but threw up work round the place and proceeded to starve the Spaniards out. The latter had considerable stores of food, but suffered severely from thirst until they were fortunate enough to discover a spring and were thus enabled to hold out until the arrival of Cortez. The latter refused to comply with the request of Montezuma to see him. He had some reason to doubt the good faith of the emperor, for he had discovered that the latter had sent envoys to Narvaez, and he had, upon his arrival at Tlaxcala, been informed that the rising at Mexico had been, to a great extent, prepared beforehand by the orders of Montezuma, and even the assurances of the officers of the garrison that they owed their safety to the emperor's intervention did not pacify him. The real reason, no doubt, of his anger was that he found he had overrated the advantages he would gain from Montezuma being in his hands, but for this he himself, and not the emperor, was to blame. At first the capture had all the success that he had expected from it. The people had obeyed their emperor as implicitly, when a captive, as when his power had been supreme. They had sent in their nobles, prisoners and bound, at his orders. They had built ships for these strangers. They had suffered them to go unmolested through the country. But there was an end even to Aztec patience. The avarice of the white men had drained the country of its wealth. Their arrogance had humiliated their pride. Their occupation of their holiest temple and the insults to their gods had aroused them to fury, and the massacre in cold blood of six hundred of their nobles while engaged in religious devotions had been the signal for an explosion. Their emperor, formerly so venerated, they now regarded with contempt as the creature of the Spaniards, as the betrayer of his country, and the thought of his safety no longer restrained their thirst for vengeance. Cortez, however, was in no mood to reflect. "'What have I to do with this dog of a king?' he exclaimed, "'who suffers us to starve before his eyes. "'Go, tell your master and his people,' he said fiercely to the Mexicans, "'to open the markets, or we will do it for them, at their cost.' The chiefs, who were the bearers of Montezuma's message, left his presence in deep resentment, and reported to the emperor and to the people outside the manner in which Montezuma's request for an interview had been refused. Cortez, however, thought it politic to release Cuatlahua, Montezuma's brother, who had been among those imprisoned for taking share in Cacama's league, and allowed him to go into the city, thinking that he would allay the tumult. But Cuatlahua was a man of different spirit from his brother. He was heir presumptive to the throne, and a bold and daring prince. The people welcomed him at once as Montezuma's representative, and chose him to represent the emperor during his confinement. Cuatlahua accepted the post, and immediately set to work to organize the fighting men and to arrange a plan of attack. Roger had not been with the party that accompanied Cortez on his expedition against Narvaez, but with his two companions remained to form part of the garrison of the palace. "'You are out of spirits, young fellow,' Juan said on the day after Cortez had marched away. "'You are changed very much since you first joined us.' "'I have much to make me so, Juan,' Roger replied in his broken Spanish. "'You see, I am white by blood, but I have dear friends among the natives. What do I see? As a white, I perceive that our position here is one of the gravest danger, and that destruction may fall upon us all. As a friend of the natives, I see the country plundered, the people trodden down, and, sooner or later, the ruin and misery of the whole people. "'You mean we are in danger from Narvaez people,' Juan said." I have faith in Cortez. He will either fight them or bring them over. He is a wonderful man and will find some way out of the difficulty. 
i do not mean that entirely roger replied i mean that there is danger from the natives pooh the old soldier said disdainfully the natives are no better than so many women but even women may be serious opponents when they are fifty to one juan and you mistake these mexicans they have been friendly and submissive because it has been the order of the emperor but although physically not strong they are brave the aztec army has spread the dominion of mexico over a wide extent of country they have conquered many peoples and are by no means to be despised it is true you beat the tlascalans but that was not because you were braver than they were but because of your superior arms and armor and above all by the terror inspired by your horses but this will not last the mexicans now know that you are but men like themselves and when they fight inspired both by national spirit and the memory of their wrongs i tell you that you will have hard work to hold your own ah well juan grumbled if it must come it must it will not disturb my appetite when roger learned that orders had been given for the massacre at the temple he determined firmly that he would take no part in the deed whatever it might cost him to refuse fortunately he found no difficulty in persuading one of the soldiers told off to act as a guard at the palace during the absence of the rest to change places with him as the man wanted to have his share in the expected plunder had cacama been at liberty roger would not have hesitated a moment but would have left the spaniards and thrown in his lot with the mexicans but now it was impossible to do so the frenzied population would have seized any white man they came upon outside the walls of the palace and would have carried him to the altars of their gods it would be hopeless to endeavor to explain that he was of another race all white men would be alike in their eyes he bitterly regretted now that he had returned from tezcuco had he at that time gone with the queen and princess to the house of his friend cuitcatl he could have remained there in quiet and the natives would have seen that he at least had no part or share in this horrible massacre now it seemed to him that there was nothing to be done save to share the lot of the spaniards whatever that might be he believed that the mexicans would storm the palace and slaughter all within it long before the return of cortez and he by no means shared the confident anticipation of the soldiers that the general on his arrival would very speedily put down any insurrection that might occur and would with the assistance of the soldiers of narvaez soon bring all mexico into subjection it had happened that both juan and pedro had also been on guard during the massacre this was a great satisfaction to him for he felt he could no longer have remained in intimate communication with them had their hands been drenched with innocent blood when upon their being relieved at their posts they joined each other in the chamber they shared in common the old soldier held up his hand and said gruffly do you hold your tongue sancho i know what you are thinking lad as well as if you said it and maybe i do not disagree with you but least said soonest mended these rooms without doors are not places for a man to relieve his mind by strong language if he happens to differ from his superiors it is a bad business and a shameful one at cholula there was some excuse for it here there is none i am an old soldier and have taken many a life in my time but never in cold blood like this say nothing lad at any rate until you get a chance of being outside this city or on the lake where none can get near you then pour it out as much as you like it is like enough roger said that none of us will ever go out of the city alive and it will serve us thoroughly right if this is to be a spaniard and a catholic let me be a mexican and a heathen there there that is enough juan interrupted now let us have our supper i can eat nothing roger said throwing himself down on the couch where he remained in silence until a sudden outburst of wild shouts and cries followed instantly by the trumpet 
calling every man to his allotted place on the walls, aroused him. "'The work of vengeance has begun,' he said gravely, as he put on his thick padded jerkin and helmet and took up his pike. "'I only hope I may see Alvarado, the author of this massacre, killed before I am.' Juan shook his head as Roger left the room, and he followed with Pedro. "'In faith, I do not blame him. He has been brought up among these people.' "'He is quite right,' the young soldier said. "'It is a shameful business. Had I known that we were coming here to be butchers, I would never have taken service under Cortez. What should we have said if, on our first arrival here, when Montezuma entertained Cortez and all the cavaliers, his people had slain them at the feast? "'Hold your tongue, you young fool,' Juan muttered angrily. "'The thing is done, and you cannot undo it. What we have to do now is to fight for our lives. Even if these poor devils have right on their side, it is not a matter to stop and discuss now. So keep your breath for fighting. I doubt not that we shall soon scatter them like chaff. But this was by no means the case, and it was only the intervention of Montezuma that saved the garrison from destruction. The time until the arrival of Cortez had passed slowly. The soldiers, weakened by hunger and thirst, muttered angrily against the officer who had so rashly brought them into this strait. Few of them regretted the deed for its own sake, but simply because it had brought on them peril and misfortune. Roger had borne his share of the fighting on the walls. He was defending his life, and although at first he had fought with little ardor, the pain given by two arrows which pierced his cotton armor heated his blood, and he afterwards fought as stoutly as the rest. During the period of inaction he had, more than once, tried to obtain an interview with Kakama, but the prisoners were jealously watched, and no one was allowed access to them on any pretext, and two officers always accompanied the men who took in their daily rations. They were regarded as hostages, only less important than Montezuma himself, and as most of them were very rich and powerful caziques, they might offer bribes, which might well shake the fidelity of any private soldier. When the news arrived that Cortez, with the whole of the army of Narvaez, was at hand, the depression that had reigned gave way to exultation, and the soldiers believed that they would now take the offensive and, without loss of time, put an end to the insurrection. Marina had accompanied Cortez on his expedition, for she was still necessary to him as an interpreter, and her influence with the natives was great. Roger obtained an interview with her a few hours after her return. She had evidently been crying passionately. "'My heart is broken, Roger,' she said. "'I had hoped that the white men would have done great things for my country. They know so much.' and although I thought there might be trouble at first, for great changes can never be introduced without trouble, I never dreamed of anything like this. Cholula was bad enough, but there the people brought it on themselves, and the Spaniards would have been slain had they not first begun to kill. But here it is altogether different. It was an unprovoked massacre, and after this, who can hope that the whites and Mexicans can ever be friendly together. I love Cortez. He is great and generous, and had he been here, this would have never happened. But many of his people are cruel, and they are all greedy of wealth, and he, general though he is, has to give way to them. I remember that, in the old days at Tabasco, you told me how cruelly the Spaniards had treated the people of the islands, but when I saw them first, I thought that you, being of a different nation, had spoken too hardly of them. I see now that you were right. I have, all along, done what I could for my people, and, though I am with the invaders, I am sure they recognize this, and that they feel no ill will against me. But now I fear that they will curse me, as they will curse them, and that, through all time, my name will be abhorred in Mexico." and she again burst into tears. 
I do not think so, Malinche. At Tezcuco it was always said that you stood between the natives and the whites, and it was owing to you that they were not more harsh than they were. As to this massacre, God forbid that I should say a single word in defense of it. As a white man and a Christian, I feel it is an act of horrible atrocity. But it should not make such an impression upon your people, who make wars solely to obtain victims, whom they may sacrifice at the altars of their gods, and who, every year, slay in cold blood fully twenty-five thousand people who have done them no wrong. By the side of such horrible slaughter as this, the murder of six hundred the other day was but a drop in the ocean of blood annually shed here. Had it been in battle, it would have been nothing, Malincha said. Had they offered them up at the altars of the gods, the people would have understood it, for they do it themselves. But this was a foul act of treachery, who, after this, can believe in the promises of the whites. I know the people. You whites despise them, because they have hitherto allowed themselves to be subdued without resistance. But now that their first awe of the Spaniards has died away, and they have nerved themselves to take up arms, you will find that they are brave. I see nothing but trouble before us. Cortez feels confident that he can easily repulse any attack and subdue the city and the country round. But I do not think so. Nor do I, Malincha. No men could have fought more bravely than the Mexicans the other day. It is true that we were but in small numbers, and that we are now many times stronger, and have Cortez to command us. But on the other hand, the attack was but a hasty one, and the next time we shall have the whole Mexican force upon us. What will you do, Roger? I must fight for the Spaniards, Roger said gloomily. They are not my countrymen, but they are white men as I am, and surrounded by foes. Besides, I have no option. The Mexicans cannot distinguish between Spaniards and Englishmen, and I should be seized and sacrificed were I to set foot beyond the walls. Were it not for that, I would leave the city, join Amentia, and leave the Spaniards and Mexicans to fight out their quarrel as they might. But now, whichever one, the result would be fatal to me. If the Mexicans were victorious, I, like all other whites, would be sacrificed to their gods. If the Spaniards won, I should be executed as a traitor. Therefore there is nothing for me to do but to remain with the Spaniards and share their fate, whatever it may be. The next morning silence reigned over the city. Not a Mexican was to be seen anywhere near the palace, within which the Spaniards were virtually prisoners. Cortez hoped, however, that Cuitlahua would soon persuade the people to return to their usual habits and to open the markets for provisions. But in any case, he felt so confident of his power to overawe the city that he sent off a messenger with dispatches to the coast, saying that he had arrived safely and should soon overcome all opposition. In half an hour, however, the messenger returned at a gallop, wounded in a score of places. He reported that the city was up in arms, the drawbridges were raised, and the Mexicans were marching towards the palace. Scarcely had he arrived when the sentinels on the towers shouted that masses of men were approaching by all the streets leading to the palace, and immediately afterwards the terraces and flat roofs of the houses near were darkened by throngs of natives shouting and brandishing their weapons. The trumpet instantly sounded to arms, and so strict was the discipline that prevailed that, in an incredibly short time, every soldier was at his post. The position was capable of being defended against a very numerous enemy, unprovided with artillery, for the wall round the great one-storied building, though low, was strong, and the turrets placed at intervals upon it enabled the defenders to command its face and to pour missiles upon any who might be bold enough to endeavor to effect a breach by undermining it with crowbars and levers. The garrison, too, were sufficient for its defense, 
for there were not only some twelve hundred Spaniards, but the eight thousand Tlascalan allies. The Aztecs rushed forward with the shrill whistle used as a battle cry by the people of Anahuac, and as they advanced, poured a rain of missiles of all kinds upon the palace, to which were added those shot from the terraces and flat roofs. The Spaniards had pierced the walls with embrasures for their cannon, and these commanded all the avenues. The gunners waited until the columns were close at hand, and then their terrible discharge swept lanes through the crowded masses in the streets. For a moment the Mexicans paused, paralyzed by the terrible slaughter, and then, rallying, rushed forward again. Three times the cannon were discharged into their midst, but, though broken and disordered, they still pressed on until they swept up to the very foot of the walls, pouring in a hail of arrows. They were well seconded by those on the housetops who, from their elevated position, were on a level with the Spaniards, and whose missiles, arrows, javelins, and stones, thrown with great force from slings, galled the defenders greatly and wounded great numbers of them. In vain did the Aztecs strive to climb the walls. These were of no great height, but, as they showed their heads above the parapet, they were shot down by the Spanish arquebus men, or struck backwards by the weapons of the Tlascalans. Failing to scale the walls, they tried to batter down the parapet with heavy pieces of timber. But the stonework was too strong, and they then shot burning arrows into the palace and hurled blazing torches over the wall. The palace itself was of stone, but some of the exterior works which had been constructed were of wood, and these were soon on fire. The defenders had no water with which to extinguish the flames, and at the point where the new works joined the wall, the fire was so fierce that they were afraid it would spread to the palace, and, to extinguish it, were forced to adopt the desperate expedient of overthrowing the wall upon the burning mass. The breach thus made was guarded by a battery of heavy guns and a party of arquebusiers, and these repelled every attempt of the Mexicans to take advantage of the breach which had been thus formed. The fight continued until night fell, and the Mexicans then drew off. Cortez and his followers were astonished at the obstinacy with which they had fought, and the contempt of death they had displayed. They had obtained such easy victories, with forces but a fourth of those which Cortez now commanded, that he had formed the lowest opinion of the fighting powers of the Aztecs. But he now found that a nation was not to be trampled upon with impunity. However, he consoled himself with the thought that this was but a temporary outbreak of fury, and he determined to sally out with all his force on the following morning, and to inflict a terrible chastisement upon his assailants. As soon as the morning broke, the Spaniards were under arms. Cortez was speedily undeceived in his hopes that the slaughter of the previous day would have cowed the Mexicans. The great square and the streets leading to it were seen to be crowded with foes who appeared better organized than on the previous day, being divided into regiments, each with its banners. These, the Mexican attendants on Montezuma told them, were the cognizances of the many cities of the plain, showing that the whole people were joining in the movement commenced by those of the capital. Towering above the rest was the royal standard of Mexico. Among the crowd were numerous priests, who, with excited gestures, called upon them to avenge the insulted gods and to destroy the handful of invaders who had brought disgrace upon the nation, had trampled it underfoot, had made their sovereign a captive, and murdered their nobles in cold blood. It was evident that, fierce as had been the fighting on the previous day, the renewed assault would be even more formidable. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of With Cortez in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 18. The Rising in Mexico. The appearance of the vast crowd that surrounded the palace differed much from that which they had presented on the previous day when the Mexicans had fought in their usual garments or in their padded cuirasses. Today they had laid aside all their garments save their loincloths, having found by experience that their cotton armor was absolutely useless against the missiles of the Spaniards. The chiefs were now conspicuous as they moved to and fro among the dark masses by their gay dresses and the metal breastplates worn over the bright featherwork. They wore helmets made to resemble the heads of ferocious wild beasts, crested with bristly hair or surmounted by bright feather plumes. Some wore only a red fillet around their head, having tufts of cotton hanging from it, each tuft denoting some victory in which they had taken part, and their own rank in the army. Noble and citizen, priest and soldier, had all united in the common cause. The assault was about to commence, when the Spaniards' artillery and musketry poured death into the crowded ranks. The gates were at once thrown open, and Cortez, at the head of his cavalry, dashed out, followed by the infantry and the Tlaxcalan allies. Confused by the slaughter made by the firearms, the Aztecs could offer no resistance to the onslaught. The cavalry trampled them underfoot and mowed them down with sword and lance. The Spanish foot and Tlaxcalans followed close behind, carried on the work of destruction, and it seemed to the Spaniards that the fight was already over when the Aztecs fled before them. The moment of retreat, however, ceased the moment the Mexicans reached the barricades which they had thrown up across the streets, and forming behind these they made a gallant stand, while those upon the housetops poured showers of arrows, darts, and great stones down upon the advancing Spaniards. In vain the Spanish artillery were brought up, and their fire swept away the barricades. There were still others behind and at each the desperate fight was renewed. Coming down the side streets, the Aztecs fell upon the Spanish flanks, and clouds of missiles were shot from the boats, which crowded the canals everywhere intersecting the streets. Cortez and his cavaliers continued to make desperate charges through the Aztecs, who, although unable to withstand the weight and impetus of the horses, closed round them, striving to throw the riders from their backs and to stab the horses themselves, throwing away their lives without hesitation on the chance of getting one blow at the Spaniards. The moment the horsemen drew back, the Aztecs followed them, and although their loss was immense, the ranks were instantly filled up again, while the Spaniards could ill spare the comparatively small number who fell on their side. At last, after hours of carnage, the Spaniards, exhausted by their exertions, and having eaten nothing since the night before, fell back to the palace. Diaz, one of the historians of the events, who was present at the combat, expressed the astonishment felt by the Spaniards at the desperation with which the despised Mexicans had fought. The Mexicans, he said, fought with such ferocity that if we had had the assistance of ten thousand hectares and as many Orlandos, we should have made no impression on them. There were several of our troops who had served in the Italian wars, but neither there nor in the battles with the Turk have they ever seen anything like the desperation shown by these Indians. As the Spaniards fell back, the Aztecs followed them, pouring in volleys of stones and arrows, and as soon as they had entered the palace, encamped around it, showing that their spirit was wholly unbroken. Although, as it was contrary to their custom to fight at night, they did not renew the attack. They shouted insulting threats as to the Spaniards' fate when they should fall into their hands, and were evidently well satisfied with the events of the day, and looked for victory on the morrow. 
Cortez had received a severe wound in the hand during the fight, and he and his companions felt how grievously they had mistaken the character of the Aztecs. They had sallied out that morning, confident in their power to crush out the insurrection. They returned, feeling that their situation was well-nigh desperate, and that henceforth they must fight not for dominion but for life. As soon as Dave broke, the fight was renewed, but this time it was the Aztecs and not the Spaniards who began it. There was no idea of a fresh sortie. All that the garrison could hope was to defend their position. So furiously did the natives attack that, for a time, they forced their way into the entrenchments. But the Spaniards, whose turn it was to fight with the bravery of despair, fell upon them with such fury that none of those who had gained an entry returned. Cortez now sent to Montezuma to request him to interpose, as he had done before, between them and his people. The emperor refused to interfere. He had viewed the desperate fighting of the last two days with bitter humiliation. He had seen his brother, Cuatlahua, leading on his troops with the greatest gallantry, while he himself, thanks to his own conduct, was a helpless prisoner. He mourned over the terrible losses his people were suffering, and the fact that his kindness to the Spaniards had brought upon him nothing but ill-treatment and insult at their hands had earned him the contempt of his people, and had involved his country in misfortune and ruin, cut him to the heart. "'What have I to do with Malinzin?' he said coldly. "'I desire only to die.' Then, still further urged, he added, "'It is useless. They will neither believe me, nor the false words and promises of Malinzin. You will never leave these walls alive. On being assured that the Spaniards would willingly depart and leave the country, if their assailants would open a way to them, he at last consented to address the people. Clothing himself in his richest robes of state, he ascended the central turret of the palace, surrounded by a guard of Spaniards and accompanied by several Aztec nobles. When he was seen, the din of war ceased as if by magic. A dead silence fell upon the multitude, and they knelt and prostrated themselves before the sovereign they had so long held in the deepest reverence. But when he addressed them, assuring them that he was a guest and not a prisoner of the Spaniards, and ordered them to lay down their arms and to allow the Spaniards to march to the coast, indignation at his cowardice overpowered their feelings of reverence and respect. They burst into taunts and execrations, and a moment later a storm of missiles were hurled at the man who had betrayed them. The Spanish guards, seeing the effect his presence had produced, had stood aside to enable him the better to be seen, and before they could close around him and cover him with their shields, three missiles struck him, one a stone hurled from a sling, smiting him on the head with such violence that he fell insensible. When the Aztecs saw him fall, their brief outburst of indignation was succeeded by one of sorrow, and with a cry of grief the whole multitude dispersed, and in a minute or two the crowded square was wholly deserted. Montezuma was carried to his chamber. When he recovered sensibility, he refused absolutely to allow his wounds to be dressed, and tore off the bandages. Not a word passed his lips. He sat in an attitude of the deepest dejection. His own people despised him and had raised their hands against him. He had drunk deeply of the cup of humiliation at the hands of the Spaniards, but this last drop filled it to overflowing. There was nothing for him but to die. The Spanish leaders tried, but in vain, to persuade him to submit to surgical treatment. He paid no attention to their words, and they were soon called away by fresh danger from without. The Aztecs had speedily recovered from their emotion at seeing the fall of the emperor, and a body of five or six hundred of them, including many nobles and military leaders of high rank, 
had taken possession of the great temple, and now from its summit, a hundred and fifty feet high, opened a rain of missiles upon the palace. The Spaniards could not effectually return their fire, for the Aztecs were sheltered by the sanctuaries on the summit of the pyramids. It was absolutely necessary, for the safety of the defenders, to dislodge them from this position, and Cortes ordered his chamberlain, Don Escobar, with a hundred men, to storm the Teocali and set fire to the sanctuaries. But the little force were three times repulsed, and forced to fall back with considerable loss. Cortes then, though suffering much from the wound in his left hand, determined himself to lead the assault. As he was incapable of holding his shield, he had it strapped to his left arm, and with three hundred picked men and some thousands of the Tlascalans sallied out from the palace and attacked the Aztecs in the temple at the foot of the pyramid. The Spaniards made their way through these without much difficulty, and then commenced the ascent of the pyramid. This offered great facilities for defense. There were five terraces connected by steps, so placed that those mounting the pyramid had to make the whole circuit on each terrace before reaching the steps leading to the next. It was thus necessary to pass round the pyramid four times, or nearly two miles, exposed to the missiles of those upon the summit. Leaving a strong body of Spaniards and Tlascalans at the bottom to prevent the natives ascending and attacking him in the rear, Cortes led the way up the staircase, followed closely by his principal officers. In spite of the heavy stones and beams of wood which, with a storm of arrows, were hurled down upon them, the Spaniards won their way from terrace to terrace, supported by the fire of their musketeers below, until at last they reached the great platform on the summit of the pyramid. Here a terrible conflict commenced, the Aztecs brought to bay, and fighting not only for life, but in the presence of their country's gods, displayed a valor at least equal to that of the Spaniards. Numbers were slightly in their favor, but this was far more than counterbalanced by the superior arms of the Spaniards, and by the armor which rendered them almost invulnerable to the comparatively puny weapons of the Mexicans. And yet, for three hours the fight continued. At the end of that time, all the Mexicans, save two or three priests, were killed, while forty-five of the Spaniards had fallen, and almost all the others were wounded. While this fight had been raging, the combat had ceased elsewhere, the combatants on both sides being absorbed in the struggle taking place at the summit of the temple. They could not, of course, judge how it was going, though they caught sight of the combatants as they neared the edges of the platform, which was unprotected by wall or fence, and many in the course of the struggle fell or were hurled over it. The moment the struggle was over, the Spaniards rushed with exulting shouts into the sanctuary of the Mexican god, reeking with the blood of fresh-killed victims, cast the image from its pedestal, rolled it across the platform to the head of the steps, and then, amid shouts that were echoed by their comrades below, sent it bounding down, while a cry of anguish and dismay rose from the Mexicans. The image dethroned, fire was applied to the sanctuary, and the smoke and flames rising up must have told countless thousands watching the capital from the housetops of the neighboring cities that the white men had triumphed over the gods of Mexico, and that, as at Cholula, so at the capital, these had proved impotent to protect their votaries from the dread invaders. So dismayed were the Mexicans at the misfortune that they offered no resistance to the return of the Spaniards from the temple, and retired to their houses without further fighting. At night the Spaniards sallied out again, relying upon the habit of the Mexicans to abstain from fighting at night, and burnt several hundred houses. Believing that the spirit of the Mexicans would be broken now, Cortes, on the following morning, mounted the turret from which Montezuma had addressed them. Malincha was by his side, and when he held up his hands to show that he wished to address them, 
a silence fell upon the multitude, and Malinche's voice was heard plainly by them as she translated the words of Cortez. He told them they must now feel that they could not struggle against the Spaniards. Their gods had been cast down, their dwellings burnt, their warriors slaughtered, and all this they had brought on themselves by their rebellion. Yet, if they would lay down their arms and return to the obedience of their sovereign, he would stay his hand. If not, he would make their city a heap of ruins, and leave not a soul alive to mourn over it. But Cortez learned at once that the spirit he had roused in the Mexicans was in no way lowered by their reverses. One of the great chiefs answered him that it was true he had hurled down their gods and massacred their countrymen, but they were content to lose a thousand lives for every one that they took. Our streets, he said, are still thronged with warriors. Our numbers are scarcely diminished. Yours are lessening every day. You are dying with hunger and sickness. Your provisions and water are failing. You must soon fall into our hands. The bridges are broken down, and you cannot escape. There will be too few of you left to satisfy the vengeance of the gods. When he had finished, a shower of arrows showed that hostilities had recommenced. The garrison were now completely disheartened. Of what use the tremendous exertions they had made, and the lives that had been lost. They were still, as they had been on the first day of their arrival, hemmed in in their fortress, surrounded by foes thirsting for their blood. Great numbers were wounded, more or less severely. Their provisions were well-nigh gone. The enemy were bolder than ever. They had been promised wealth and honor. They were starving, and death stared them in the face they loudly exclaimed that they had been deceived and betrayed. But the men who had served all along with Cortez stood firm. They had still every confidence in their leader. It was not his fault that they had been brought to this pass, but by the misconduct of others during his absence. At any rate, as they pointed out to their comrades, the only chance of escape was unity and obedience. Cortez himself was, as always in a moment of great danger, calm and collected. The thought of having to leave the city, to abandon all the treasures they had taken, was even more painful to him than to the soldiers. It was not the loss of his own share of the booty, but of that of the emperor that he regretted, for he felt that this, together with the downfall of all his plans and the loss of the kingdom he had already counted won, would bring upon him the displeasure of his emperor, would give strength to his enemies at court, and would probably ensure his being recalled in disgrace. Nevertheless, he saw that retreat was necessary, for the position could not be maintained. Every day the defenses became weaker, the men more exhausted by fighting, and there would soon be no longer a morsel of bread to serve out to them. A retreat must therefore be made." The question was which route should be chosen. In any case, one of the narrow dikes connecting the island city with the shore must be traversed, and on these causeways the Spaniards would fight under great disadvantage. Finally, he settled upon that leading to Tlacopan, which was much the shortest, being only two miles in length. For some days a large party of men had been at work constructing movable towers, similar to those used centuries before, in sieges. They moved on rollers and were to be dragged by the Tlascalan allies. From their summits, the soldiers could shoot down upon the housetops from which they had been hitherto so annoyed. The towers were also provided with bridges, which could be let down onto the roofs, and so enable the soldiers to meet their opponents hand to hand. When the structures were completed, the Spaniards again took the offensive. The gates were opened, and the three towers, dragged by the Tlascalans, moved out. The Mexicans, astonished at the sight of these machines, from whose summits a heavy fire of musketry were kept up, fell back for a time. The towers were moved up close to the terraces, 
and the soldiers, after partly clearing them by their fire, lowered the light bridges and, crossing, engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with the Mexicans and drove them from their positions. But from the lofty houses of the nobles, the Mexicans still maintained their resistance. The towers were not high enough to overlook these, and as they came up, beams of wood and huge stones were cast down upon them, striking with such force that it soon became evident to those within them that the towers would not hold together. They were dragged on, however, till a canal crossed the road. The bridge had been removed, and both the cavalry and the towers were brought to a standstill. The latter were abandoned, and Cortez ordered his troops to make a road forward by filling up the canals with stones and wood from the houses near. While engaged in this operation, they were exposed to an incessant fire from every point of advantage in the neighborhood and from the opposite bank of the canal. The work was, however, completed, and the cavalry, crossing, drove the Mexicans headlong down the great street till they came to another canal, where the same work had again to be performed. No less than seven canals crossed the street, and it took two days of constant fighting before the last of these was crossed and the whole street in their hands. Just as the last canal had been captured, Cortez, who was ever at the head of his men, received news that the Mexicans desired to open a parley with him, and that some of their nobles had arrived at the palace for that purpose. Delighted at the news, he rode back with his officers. The Mexicans requested that the two priests, who had been captured in the great temple, should be released, and should be the bearers of his terms, and discuss the negotiations. Cortez at once consented, and the priests left with the envoys, with instructions that, if the Mexicans would lay down their arms, the past should be forgiven. The mission was, however, a mere trick. The Mexicans were most anxious to rescue the priests, one of whom was the high priest, and therefore most sacred in their eyes. Cortez had scarcely sat down to a meal, which he sorely needed after his fatigues, when the news was brought that the Mexicans had again attacked with greater fury than ever, and at three points had driven off the detachments placed to guard the newly made causeways across the canal. Cortez and his companions leaped on their horses and, riding down the great street, again cleared it. But no sooner had he reached the other end than the Mexicans, gathering in the lanes and side streets, poured in again, and overpowered the guard at one of the principal canals. Swarms of warriors poured in on all sides, and a storm of arrows and other missiles was poured down upon Cortez and his cavaliers. The confusion at the broken bridge was tremendous. The cavalry and infantry struggled fiercely with the crowds of foes, while others strove again to repair the bridge which the Mexicans had again torn down. Cortez himself performed prodigies of valor in covering the retreat of his men, dashing alone into the midst of the ranks of the enemy, shouting his battle cry, and dealing death with every blow of his sword. So far did he penetrate among his foes that report spread that he was killed, and when at last he fought his way back and leaped his horse over a chasm still remaining in the bridge, his escape was regarded by his troops as absolutely miraculous, and it was said that he had been saved by the national apostle St. James and the Virgin Mary, who had fought by his side. At night the Mexicans, as usual, drew off, and the Spaniards, dispirited and exhausted, fell back to their citadel. That evening Montezuma died. He had refused all nourishment, as well as medicine, from the time he had been wounded. Father Almedo did his best to persuade him to embrace the Christian faith, but Montezuma stoutly refused. Just before he died, he sent for Cortez and recommended his three daughters by his principal wife to his charge, begging him to interest his master, the emperor, on their behalf, and to see that they had some portion of their rightful inheritance. "'Your lord will do this,' he said, 
if only for the friendly offices I have rendered the Spaniards, and for the love that I have shown them, though it has brought me to this condition, but for this I bear them no ill will. This Cortez promised, and, after the conquest, took the three ladies into his own family. They were instructed in the doctrines of Christianity, and were married to Spanish nobles, and handsome dowries assigned to them. The news of Montezuma's death was received with real grief by the Spaniards, to whom his generosity and constant kindness and gentleness of manner had endeared him. There can be but little doubt that, in spite of the accusations against him of meditating treachery, Montezuma was, from the time they entered the capital, sincere in his good will towards the Spaniards. He was devoted to his own gods, and believed implicitly in the prophecy that Quetzalcoatl, or his descendants, would return to rule Mexico. Their superior science and attainments confirmed him in his belief that the Spaniards fulfilled the prophecy, and he was willing to resign alike his power, his possessions, and himself to their hands. In his early days he had shown great personal bravery, and the cowardice he displayed throughout the whole of his dealing with the Spaniards was the result of superstition, and not that of personal fear. Cortes paid all respect to the remains of his late unhappy captive. The body was arrayed in royal robes and laid on a fire, and was carried by the nobles, who had remained faithful to him during his imprisonment, into the city. It is uncertain where Montezuma was finally buried. With the death of the emperor, the last hope of the Spaniards of making terms with their assailants vanished. There was nothing now but retreat. After some debate, it was settled that this should take place at night, when they would find the Mexicans unprepared. The difficulties of passage would be greater, but these would, it was thought, be counterbalanced by the advantage of being able to make at least a portion of their retreat unobserved. It was determined that no time should be lost. The Mexicans would doubtless be mourning over the body of Montezuma, and would be unprepared for such prompt action on the part of the Spaniards. The first question was the disposal of the treasure. The soldiers had, for the most part, converted their share of the gold into chains, which they wore around their necks. But there was a vast amount in bars and ornaments, constituting the one-fifth, which had been set aside for the crown, the one-fifth for Cortes himself, and the shares of his principal officers. One of the strongest horses was laden with the richest portion of the crown treasure, but all the rest was abandoned. The gold lay in great heaps. "'Take what you like of it,' Cortes said to his men, "'but be careful not to overload yourselves. He travels safest in the dark, who travels lightest.' His own veterans took his advice, and contented themselves with picking out a few of the most valuable ornaments. But the soldiers of Narvaez could not bring themselves to leave such treasures behind them, and loaded themselves up with as much gold as they could carry. Cortes now arranged the order of march. The van was composed of two hundred Spanish foot and twenty horsemen, under the orders of Gonzalo de Sandoval. The rear guard, with the main body of the infantry, and the greater portion of the guns, was commanded by Alvarado and Velasquez de Leon. Cortes himself led the center, which was in charge of the baggage, some of the heavy guns, and the prisoners, among whom were a son and two daughters of Montezuma, Cacama, and the other nobles who had been in prison with him. The Tlascalans were divided among the three corps. A portable bridge had been prepared for crossing the canals which intersected the causeway, the intention being that it should be laid across a canal, that the army should pass over it, and that it should then be carried forward to the next gap in the causeway. This was a most faulty arrangement, necessitating frequent and long delays, and entailing almost certain disaster. Had three such portable bridges been constructed, the column could have crossed the causeway with comparatively little risk, 
and there was no reason why these bridges should not have been constructed as they could have been carried without difficulty by the tlascalans at midnight the troops were in readiness for the march mass was performed by father almedo and at one o'clock on july first fifteen twenty the spaniards sallied out from the fortress that they had so stoutly defended silence reigned in the city as noiselessly as possible the troops made their way down the broad street expecting every moment to be attacked but even the tramping of the horses and the rumbling of the baggage wagons and artillery did not awake the sleeping mexicans and the head of the column arrived at the head of the causeway before they were discovered then as the advanced guard were preparing to lay the portable bridge across the first opening some aztec sentinels gave the alarm the priests on the summits of the temples heard their cries and at once sounded their horns and the huge war-drum instantly the city awoke and the silence was succeeded by a roar of sound the vanguard had scarcely got upon the causeway when canoes shot out upon the lake and soon a storm of stones and arrows burst upon the column more and more terrible did it become as fresh canoes crowded with the warriors came up many of these pushed up to the causeway itself and the natives landing fell upon the spaniards with fury the latter made no stay fighting their way through their foes they pressed on until they reached the next opening in the causeway and there waited for the bridge to come up but a column many thousands strong with baggage and artillery takes a long time to cross a bridge and the advanced guard had reached the opening long before the rear had passed the bridge and there stood helpless exposed to the terrible storm of missiles until at last the column were all across the bridge then forty picked men who had been specially told off for the task tried to raise it so that it might be carried to the front but the weight of the baggage wagons and artillery had so wedged it into the earth that they were unable to move it they persevered in their efforts until most of them had fallen the rest bore the terrible news to the army that the bridge was immovable a terrible cry of despair arose as the news spread all hope seemed lost and regardless of order or discipline all pressed forward to endeavor in some way or other to cross the obstacle that barred their way pressed on by those behind them sandoval and his cavaliers dashed into the water the distance was short but the horses were weak from hunger and burdened by their own heavy armor and that of their riders some succeeded in swimming across others sank while some reached the opposite side only to fall back again as they tried to climb the steep bank the infantry followed them throwing away their armor to enable them to swim some succeeded others were pressed down by their comrades many were killed by the war clubs or spears of the mexicans in their canoes others again half stunned by the clubs were dragged into the canoes and carried off to the city to be sacrificed all along the causeway the fight raged unceasingly the aztecs in the boats alongside leaping ashore and grappling with their foes and rolling with them down the causeway into the water while those in the distance kept up their rain of missiles the opening in the causeway was at last filled choked up with ammunition wagons and guns bales of rich goods chests of gold and the bodies of men and horses and over these the spaniards made their way cortez had swum or waded across on his horse and he rode on until he joined sandoval and the remains of the advanced guard who were checked at the third and last opening the cavaliers set the example to their followers by plunging into the water the rest followed as best they could many were drowned by the weight of the gold they carried others got across by clinging to the tails and manes of the horses cortez with sandoval and other cavaliers led the retreat until they reached the end of the causeway the din of battle was now far behind but those who came up brought the news that the rear guard were so sorely pressed that they would be destroyed unless aid reached them 
Cortez and his companions did not hesitate. They dashed along the causeway, again swam the canal, and made their way through the crowd till they reached the rear guard. Morning was breaking now, and it showed the lake covered with canoes filled with warriors. Along the whole length of the causeway a desperate fight was raging. Cortez found Alvarado on foot. His horse had been killed under him. With a handful of followers, he was still desperately defending the rear against the Mexicans who had poured out from the city in pursuit. The artillery had at first done good service, sweeping the causeway and mowing down hundreds of their assailants. But the Aztecs were careless of life, and rushed on so furiously that they swept over the guns, killing those who served them, and fell upon the infantry. The charge of Cortez and his companions, for a moment, bore back the foe, but, pressed by those behind, they swept aside resistance, and bore back the Spaniards to the edge of the canal. Cortez and his companions plunged in and swam across. Alvarado stood on the brink, hesitating. Unhorsed and defenseless, he could not make his way across the gap, which was now crowded with the canoes of the enemy. He set his strong lance on the bottom of the canal, and, using it as a leaping pole, sprang across. The feat was an extraordinary one, for although the width is not given, it was declared, by those who witnessed it, to be impossible for any mortal. It filled friends and foes alike with astonishment, and the spot is, to this day, known by the Mexicans as Alvarado's Leap. The Aztecs followed no farther. They were occupied, now, in securing the enormous wealth the Spaniards had left behind them, and the remnants of the army marched along the causeway unmolested and took possession of the village at its end. Cortez, iron-hearted as he was, sat down and burst into tears as he viewed the broken remnant of his army. He was consoled, however, by finding that many of his most trusted companions had escaped. Sandoval, Alvarado, Oled, Ordaz, and Avia were safe. And so, to his great joy, was Marina. She had, with a daughter of a Tlascalan chief, been placed under the escort of a party of Tlascalan warriors in the van of the column, and had passed unharmed through the dangers of the night. The loss of the Spaniards in their retreat is variously estimated, but the balance of authority among contemporary writers places it at 450 Spaniards and 4,000 Tlascalans. This, with the loss sustained in the previous conflicts, reduced the Spaniards to about a third and the Tlascalans to a fifth of the force which had entered the capital. The greater part of the soldiers of Narvaez had been killed, they had formed the rear guard, and had not only borne the brunt of the battle, but had suffered from the effect of their cupidity. Of the cavalry, but twenty-three remained mounted. All the artillery had been lost, and every musket thrown away in the flight. Velasquez de Leon had fallen in the early part of the retreat, bravely defending the rear, and several others among the leaders had also fallen, together with all the prisoners whom they had brought out from the capital. The remains of the army straggled on into the town of Tlacopan, but Cortez would allow of no halt there. At any moment, the exultant Aztecs from the capital might arrive, and, in a battle in the streets, the Spaniards would stand no chance whatever with their foes. He, therefore, hurried the soldiers through, and, when outside, endeavored to form them into some sort of order. It was necessary to give them a few hours of repose, and he led them towards an eminence, crowned by a temple, which commanded the plain. It was held by a party of natives, and the troops, dispirited and exhausted, refused at first to advance against them. But the influence of Cortes, backed by the example of his officers, had its usual effect. The column moved forward against the temple, and the natives, after a few discharges of missiles, abandoned the place. It was a large building, affording ample shelter for the Spaniards and their allies. Provisions were found there, and a large supply of fuel intended for the service of the temple. 
here lighting great fires they dried their clothing bound up their wounds and after partaking of food threw themselves down to sleep fortunate it was for the spaniards that the mexicans contented with the slaughter they had inflicted the plunder they had captured and most of all with the prisoners whom they had carried off to be sacrificed on their altars retired to the capital and allowed the invaders twenty-four hours breathing time had they pressed them hotly and relentlessly from the moment when they emerged from the causeway they would have annihilated them for at that time the spaniards were too worn out and dispirited to be capable of any effectual resistance food and rest however did wonders for them they were hardy veterans and with cortez and the leaders they most trusted with them they soon came to look at matters in a more cheerful light they were still stronger than they were when they first marched upon mexico why then should they despair of making their way back to tlascala where they would have rest and friends they knew there was a long and painful march before them and probably desperate battles to fight but in a fair field they felt themselves a match for any number of the enemy and when late in the evening their officers bade them form up and prepare for a night's march they fell in steadily and willingly and cortez felt that they could again be relied upon under every emergency End of chapter 18